Welcome, everyone, to the Breakout EDU Open Community Call. Uh, my name is James, and we are going to be sharing some updates uh, about Breakout, talking about facilitating Breakout EDU games, um, as well as, you know, looking at where we're going. And we have some awesome panelists uh, today who are working on some great things, as well as we may have some questions as this uh, movement grows. Uh, very excited. So let me just give a few updates and, you know, apologies if it's repetitive from the, the last call, but uh, most importantly, um, Mark Hammonds here in the U.S. is doing a great job of getting caught up on orders. I believe he's at order number 80-something as far as building boxes, and then um, the goal is to, to really make another big push uh, next Sunday to, to, to get through all 100 and I think 152 orders now, counting up to more than 200 kits out there, and that's just the boxes that, that we've built. Uh, I know many more have put together their own kits uh, through Amazon, uh, dot com. So it's a really cool organic um, growth. And one exciting update is that we are finally, and by we I mean Jeffrey, uh, shipping boxes in Canada. So so Jeff, who's covered freshly covered in sawdust, I want to hear about what's going up there in uh, in Canada. Hey James, how's it going? Uh, yeah, things are going well here. Um, made some kits today, and I've got them going out this week. I've got a couple going out in the Guelph area, one in Toronto and another in Ottawa, and I just looked on the list, and I see I think we have about 19 in queue, so uh, I guess I've got my work cut out for me the next uh, couple of weeks, hopefully get those out maybe by uh, September. That's fantastic. So kind of, if, I don't know, do you have any of the, the supplies or materials, or what's been that process like? Uh, it sounds like you're outside right now. Yeah, I'm outside. I was in the garage all day, so I just thought I'd stay outside and cool down a bit. Um, but you no, know, the process has been fine. I mean, the hardest thing I'm finding here in Canada is finding the exact same supplies sort of as you guys have there in the States. Um, so we're kind of making do and making a few uh, modifications uh, to get the uh, kit ready and out to people. So uh, just trying to source things and trying to get it at the best price so that we can uh, get as many kits into as many hands as possible. And so for everybody who's watching, kind of the, the idea here is to, as we you know, look at internationally, uh, find someone you know, like, like a Jeff who can be, you know, quote unquote, the, the licensed reseller of the, the breakout box up there. But just like any place, you know, if you're a Canadian, we encourage you to also put together your own kit or anywhere uh, around the world. And hopefully the, the games, um, you know, you're able to find the pieces to, to be able to play, play the game. So that's, that's kind of the, the thinking there. Um, so we're actually talking with a few other folks that live international to, to do the same in other countries. But, you know, just to describe, discuss why uh, we're not going to be shipping internationally anytime soon is, like, if you think about, like, either Google or Apple when they launch a product, um, how long it takes for them to work the deals to be able to ship to those different countries. Um, we decided that, you know, at least as we're a team of one and a bunch of awesome volunteers, it's not, not that we don't want to spend our time navigating those legal processes. So we just want to connect you with an awesome person um, in that country to, to be able to, to get it from them. Um, so that's the plan um, indefinitely, and we'll look at other options as we grow. And, again, I, I was just recently on... Um, the interview for Michael and the BAM radio network, which was cool, and I, you know, couched it as, you know, we see ourselves as stewards of more of this um, gaming movement rather than anything else. So um, if you know somebody or want to do it that way, let us know, and by all means, we'll give you all the, the instructions on, on how to put these things together. Um, and with that, I think Mark Hammonds is joining us live, maybe even from his garage where he's building kits. I don't know where you're at right now, Mark. I am in the garage. You are right indeed, my friend. <laughs> so Mark has personally built, uh, I think at this point, more than uh, probably 100 boxes if you calculate other stuff. Um, so one of the things that we're thinking is, oh, you can see you're about to do some of the printing of the words. One of the things that we're hoping to do maybe in the coming weeks um, is a little fun campaign around people decorating their boxes and how they customize them. So, you know, I will probably be adding a bunch of different question marks to mine. I know that Mark Hammonds has described potentially having people sign it um, if that's had have broken out or played the game. Um, so, um, Mark, do you have any updates on, on your building? I tried to say where you were at as far as shipping at numbers and whatnot. Uh, yeah, I think I'm in the neighborhood of the high 80s. I want to say it's like 88 or 89. And I've got... Uh, it looks like seven more that I'm hoping to finish up and have shipped out tomorrow. And then, you know, a good weekend of, uh, of work on it too, so I should get another 15 or 20 this weekend and uh, trying to stick true to our two- to three-week window for uh, getting everything shipped out. 
Yeah, it definitely has been, and I'm sure Mark more than anybody, appreciating the uh, the power of Amazon.com in this less than 24 hours shipping world. We're definitely, you know, building all to order, um, and so hopefully wanting to get to the point where you know we have supply to to catch up, and that's where it's awesome that we're looking at working with some high schools um, and having the high school woodshop classes, uh, building the kits and running the little businesses as as their own. So giving us some uh, authentic uh, experiences there. So um, if we tune in now, you can see how Mark transfers the the logo. One thing I wanted we figured out online is you know the logo is not actually burned on, but if you print out the logo flipped horizontally on toner, so not with inkjet but with toner, it transfers that toner ink from the paper to the wood. Um, so it's really cool so, uh, because you can't just like scratch it off. It stays there you know, relatively permanently. Um, and so what I'm going to do on mine is then take that same thing and print out a bunch of question marks and locks and stuff and then you know, stencil them on there. Um, as well, so that's you know to, to to disclose all trade secrets. That is, um, that is how the boxes get printed with our with our logos. Um, so with that, um, any other questions or comments on orders and shipping and international stuff before we move to the topic of discussion for today's call? Sweet. Um, all right. So the the purpose of today's call is two twofold. One to to hear uh, an update from uh, some of the folks out there that are actually designing the games. Um, I met one on one with uh, Michael this weekend and was completely floored by what he has been able to to put together. Um, it's it's incredible. So wanted to to give him some space to share showcase what he's working on as well as um, he has some questions for the community. Um, you know, as far as you know, the development of his games, uh, and then talk a little bit about game facilitation and you know the hint cards and how um, I introduce the game and here's some other folks and we'll talk about you know what is the the best way to facilitate one of these games um, for for learning outcomes. So um, with that. I'd love to turn the floor over to uh, Mr. Matera, and, and please introduce yourself to the to the community, and then um, show us what you're working on. All right, so I'm Michael Matera, and I teach sixth grade world history in an eighth grade international relations elective, and I just love the concept of breakout EDU and sort of escape rooms in general. Um, some of you might know that I already gamify my class and do a lot of gamification and challenges in my class. So Breakout EDU just slides in really nice as another challenge I can have my groups collaboratively try to like overcome. And when I started developing my game, uh, the first hurdle I wanted to get over was uh, I know approaching the school year, I'm going to want to try to do a breakout, you know, I'd like to say one per unit at least. Uh, but I don't want to like have to re come up with a theme every time I do it. So I came up with one that I think would have like a nice story arc. So you'll play game one, and you know if you want, you can then play game two. So I don't know if anybody in the community saw or if everyone saw, but I did a sort of intro trailer that the moderator would play to start off the game. And uh, the idea is that this artificial intelligence has taken over the world. Uh, because it, it deems the the military it was a military experiment gone wrong, and so cool. <laughs> military the uh, artificial intelligence sort of calculates that humans are the greatest threat to life on Earth, so it now is trying to sort of eradicate us. Uh, and so what I liked about it is what I'm saying is the computer because it's artificial intelligence and we give it its information or we did give it its information it gets caught in these information loops. So what I'm going to say is each of my games, like the, the, the government who's now trying to shut this thing down, gets little leaks of information and says, we know that the computer is currently stuck on, and you could insert anything, like it's currently stuck on geometry, and now you could do a geometry game, you know, and all the clues could be based on that. You could make it a mix and say, like, it's stuck on these two loops, geometry and Mesopotamia, and now the clues, like, have to pair together. Um, and I really, being obviously a classroom teacher, I'm trying to think of ways to use it with 25, 30 kids at a time. Uh, being a middle school teacher teaching four sections, I'm trying to think of a way to also change it up because you know some kid is going to spill the beans. So 
Um, I'm trying to design mine with like three or four alternative endings so a teacher could just load the second like sort of file at the end and then the second class, so if somebody tells them the answer in the end is like 27, oh, not for your class, like the answer in the end for your class is 56, uh, if that makes sense. Totally. I, I teach four sections in the same day, and like I said, I know a kid at lunch is going to spill the beans. Uh, so one of the things, the end game for me, at least in my first mission, is they're working towards uh, you know, unlocking the main box, getting into the, the little mini box, and in the mini box there's the thumb drive. And in there I'm saying that they have uh, they have uh, the, the, like the uplink to the computer that's controlling the drones. And I'm going to share my screen here for a sec so I can show you this. Give me a second here. Boop. Share. All right, you guys seeing that little access let me, code? Let me click on it so that it gets recorded. Uh, yep, we're looking at it right now. All right, so you can't really hear it because I have my volume off, but there's like a timer ticking down that you have uh, you have uh, one minute. And they'll know this in the instructions, that no matter what the breakout EDU game timer says, the moment they load this, the storyline is the computer knows you're like trying to hack in and it's going to shut down. So you have one minute to solve the final solution. And there's this number pad, and, and at first they're going to try to click it, and it's not going to work. And then I hope they notice it moves around. And I ran out of time. So I got to... All right, so they're going to notice it moves around. And when they move it, they now have to figure out which wire to cut. That's and based so on the... Cool. Based on the, you know, like clues that I give them. And I, this graphic, I intentionally made it this way so that they're the three numbers. So I can make the clue number-based or I can make the clue color-based. And if they... In this case, if they cut the blue wire, that's the correct one. Uh, it will sort of unlock the door that they needed to get into to now shut down the drones that the computer's controlling. Or if they cut the wrong wire, um, the computer's name's Chuck. So it's going to come up here and says, failed attempt, Chuck wins. And then the storyline is that he's going to blow up all of our oil fields, so I found a bunch of footage from Gulf War. And so this would be like your ending game, you lose, you didn't break out screen, uh, as opposed to winning. So that's one of the like sort of fun endings that I'm sort of working on. This looks amazing. Um, um, I think the kids okay. will like it. Yeah. What time? Any questions, any questions for, for, uh, for Michael? So, Michael, one of the questions I have is, you know, I mean, I, the process, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you said that those all work with the, uh, once the files are on a hard drive, um, the pen drive, they open up anybody on any type of computer, including a Chromebook, would just double click on it and then they would have that experience? Yep, it's, uh, those are all HTML5 files, so they, I mean, you can't plug one into an iPad, but it would work on an iPad. Yeah, yeah. You know, it would work on anything. Uh, so I tried to make it device agnostic. Uh, but at the same time, you technically don't need to be connected to the Internet either. It, like, works just off the USB drive. Uh, so I like that that feature. Um, What's the process of trying to balance, in your opinion, the uh, the online and the, and the physical as you've been structuring this game? And then also, I think, you know, you obviously teach a full group class of students. Um, just thinking, of how, have you, how have you been thinking about to accommodating a larger group size like that? Uh, I think physical's key. So I think one of the sweet things about the breakout or escape storylines and all, you know, the experience is the tactile for me. Um, you know, in this computer world, like our kids are used to sort of sitting in front of the blue screen, the glow of it. Um, so I like the idea that they're scouring around the classroom, getting clues. What I what I like to do, or what I've done so far in the game, is a bunch of my clues are physical, but then some of the physical 
needs some sort of online sort of translation, some sort of like figuring out. And so there's this like play between the two. But I, I don't want to make, you know how your kit comes with the key lock? I don't want that to be the only physical thing they have to find is the one key lock and the flashlight. Yep. I want there to be, so one of my clues are several strips of paper that have been cut up and the clue won't make sense until they find all strips of paper and sort of put it together so they then get the message. But the message itself is cryptic and they're going to need to go and look up some of Hammurabi's code of laws to figure out like what that means. Um, but they might not even understand at first that it's Hammurabi's code of laws. So there's just this law and they're yep. like my sixth graders are going to have to put two and two together that like well we're learning about Hammurabi. Like oh, oh dude he had code of laws. I bet you this is one of them. They then find out this is law one 171 and that might be the lock. You know? But they, to find that they had to find seven physical pieces cut up in the classroom. Then they got this like weird law and then they had to wait, wait, that's Hammurabi's codes. Now what law is that? They're reading through 282 of them. Find out it's law 175 or whatever. Wow, and, and that's what I love about a lot of the games that you guys are developing is this idea of um, it forces the players or the learners uh, to use deductive reasoning to be able to decide, okay, what's relevant and what's not. You know, so any type of um, you know, academic skill that we are you know, trying to teach, think of the students approaching chemistry or English, we're always looking at, you know, okay, what are the key concepts? You know, a breakout game really facilitates uh, that in a really authentic way of like, you know, what is important, what's not important as, as, we, as we go. Um, Michael, you had some questions for, for the community as far as, as you're developing yeah. these things. So looking at, I guess if I could share my screen one more time, and say, share. Uh, so I'm working on my sort of document, and what I was trying to do is two twofold. One, I want to have multiple levels. So I just, I don't know if this is cute or dumb or lame or whatever, but I named my levels because it's breakout, jail, prison, and supermax. So this was. You know, if a third grade class wants to try to play this game, maybe they would try just the jail level. But if maybe a high school class wanted to try this, maybe they'd try Supermax, you know? Um, so one, do I think my one question for the community is, is that worthwhile committing that kind of time to? Or should you just, do you think I should just design all my games with just sort of like one level, one idea? Obviously, I could make them faster if it's one level, one idea, but it's less flexible for the community then. I'll comment on that. Um, I think there's lots of value of making multiple levels uh, just because from year to year or even um, term to term you're going to have uh, similar cohorts that might have different ability levels and so being having the ability to change it up kind of fairly fast um, to kind of meet that new student or that group of students needs uh, I think it's important, well, even, important even with um, like students with different exceptionalities too you might be able to do groups uh, kind of based on where they're at and having those different levels it's going to actually make it easier for you um, sort of to quickly spin off to meet your kind of student needs. Um, I think it just you're already putting the hard work into developing the main idea of the game so changing things slightly is probably less the work than developing a whole new game uh, three times over. That's true. I like that. My, my other question, well actually not really a question, more like does anybody want to help me uh, <laughs> figure this out or does everybody have the answer already, is being a middle school teacher who teaches four sections of the same class, I want, an, I want a way to like score it. Like, so I want to not just be like, you broke out, I'd love it to be like maybe have several like layered elements like maybe there are some pieces that I hide that actually have nothing to do with solving the puzzle but you did find four of the hidden pieces so those are worth 200 points each or whatever so your team got that and they don't know that they're looking for those pieces so they may sit there and think we found four of these pieces and they must solve the clue and like they don't but they are like points at the end and then like time wise you know like if you if you both broke out but one broke out faster that's worth some points Oh, but this class got ten clues, and this other class only got six clues. You know, like I, 
clues are a penalty. You're right. So the final score is, wow, you have 3,500 points, and they had 3,600 points. Mm -hmm. Or is, or is that going down the wrong direction? I'm not quite sure, but uh, Michael, I was just going back to in terms of having um, different solutions or yeah, making uh, multiple responses there. Maybe a way of even looking at those clues or the questions there, having them sort of like seasonally adjusted. So uh, based on the season, so you could you know have at least four different solutions during the year, play the same one, but each coming out with a different uh, response. Nice. That's a cool idea. Yeah, so you could even do it, you know, even um, looking at uh, constellations and things like that, uh, nighttime, daytime. That's cool. I'm going to jot some of these ideas now. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Wes. Yep, you all right? Uh, one of the things I'm, I'm curious is, you know, thinking about your workflow as somebody who's still in the classroom, you know, obviously you have a lot of experience, you know, thinking about games and, um, you know, the, the question is, I guess, is, you know, as you start to develop them, do you think it would be good for you to kind of develop a series of games through for all the history topics right away or kind of just wait for the first one to finish Mesopotamia, run its course, and then think about how you want to design one for the, for the next unit or as, as you go? You know, what do you think would be easier um, just for you and your workflow? For me, uh, it's always easier as it approaches, right? Like, for me, I, I don't know, like when I gamify my class, I tend to think of the game part like, okay, next week we're starting Rome. What could be my fun, like, theme for my gamified class now that I'm starting Rome? Well, I guess then the next question is, how do you see it fitting in with your stuff? Is it going to be an, uh, kind of part of an anticipatory set or introducing the unit midway through, some sort of informal assessment, um, the formal assessment? What are you thinking? Uh, probably all of those, so I don't want to like, I don't know if everyone knows about a gamified class, but I do, my whole year is a long game, from day one to last day, all my students are in this long collaborative game, and their class period is their team, and so I will probably use breakout EDUs, as all the things we just mentioned, could be an awesome anticipatory set that's a great challenge that gets their team to work together hopefully feel successful that they were able to accomplish something. Um, I may do it as a mid-unit mid, uh, mid sort of uh, bottleneck. So sometimes mm -hmm. in my gamified class, there might be other activities they want to go and do to earn extra points, extra things, and that might be like the challenge they have to do to like unlock that. Um, and I could see it being an awesome final assessment. It's one of the things that, you know, I, I was going to chime in with this is the idea of maybe if you wanted to add points to it, you could say, like, every minute before 45 or 30 or whatever the time limit is is, like, an additional point, and then there's, like, 10 points for finishing the game. Um, and then maybe there's maybe an informal assessment or a quiz that's four points where, you know, based on how, can, how successful can they describe how their team won the game, right? You know, so really trying to emphasize this idea of uh, working together. So when you like say, okay, the the alpha clock block was opened how, and being able to describe, you know, what was the clue that led them to solving that, you know, whereas, you know, sometimes when I facilitated the games, and we'll transition to that topic in a minute, is I've seen an over reliance on you know a few players of the game um, and not doing a good job of making everybody on their team aware of, okay, hey guys, we just got this lock open, you know, this is the combination that we use. Um, and just and transferring that, so that might be one idea. Yeah, like to overcome that, I think in the classroom I was thinking about, for my first game, I actually break the kids down into sort of different teams. So my, my storyline is that like one team is trying to break into the like main office, another one's trying to break into the data center. So like it's forcing the, the 25 students to like break up into little groups and go on their own submissions to unlock one of the locks. And on some point, that's another bottleneck. Like, the the teams can't... We can't get to the next mega level until, like, all teams have unlocked their one lock. And tell us... You mentioned one thing, and we were talking this weekend about the idea of having an envelope, and they break yeah. something either digitally or physically, and then 
describe that process because I thought that was really unique. So one way I thought I could monitor the progress of the game and make sure certain objectives are hit is so this theme I just told you about having the groups break off and have to like unlock the lock to the you know data center. I as the moderator would have four envelopes that represent like what would be in the data center or the main offices or the computer room and oh like your team alpha team you you were successful at breaking into the data center I would hand them the data center envelope and now they can like pour over this new information that they got because they got into their their spot so that's not like laying around for them to discover it's like an element that they know is there kind of like in your uh, Dr. Johnson game, like, they see the arrows there. It's not like, and you, you could show them, like, these are the animals. Like, there's stuff in the data center. There's stuff in, but you can't get them because I'm pretending that you're outside. You're trying to unlock the door to the data center. Ooh, you, yeah. unlock, you unlock the directional lock? That was the one for the data center. Here you go. And I, think, and I think that could comes down to really using the story to sus allow people to suspend belief, right? you know, being able to say, like, get so wrapped up in the story. I think, you know, one thing I wish for, for my game, Dr. Johnson, and the next one that um, Mark and I just developed uh, called Time Warp, really trying to get better at the story. Uh, I don't think, I think Dr. Johnson's fine, but not as, 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 as good as it could be as far as story, and so really focusing on that uh, in, in the future games. One of the things that I wanted to share with the group is I had a ch chat this morning with... Uh, Professor Scott Nicholson, uh, former MIT, now a professor up in Canada. I forgot the university. But this guy's a, the, I would describe as the, the, the world expert on escape game research. Um, he um, says he's successfully solved more than 175 escape rooms around the world. Um, I don't know what that means, but that blows me away. Uh, but he's written a white paper uh, focusing on the, the research behind the learning aspects related to this type of aspect, uh, these, these games. And so um, we've just started talking, but the hope is um, at his university he's going to host a game jam um, focused on the, the breakout box and getting uh, his students and whomever wants to come to, to try to solve that problem of games for larger groups of people. Um, they, again, we're just starting the chat, but uh, really excited about the, the potential. And that's where the power of the open source and the power of the singular kit comes in. Um, one of the things that I wanted to share with the group and get input on is um, the original idea was to start with this version one of the kit and then potentially down the road six months, a year from now, have a, a science-themed kit or an English-themed kit. But um, what he suggested, and I think it's a better idea, is just saying, you know, whenever that time comes down the road, just doing an expansion pack that fits with the current kit related to science or English or something uh, like that. So I'd uh, be curious to kind of get your guys' uh, thoughts. I would say 100% go expansion packs. Like as somebody, like, I think company-wise, I think that's awesome for you guys too because I think you'd make more money. Like to be honest, I might buy the science kit even though I'm a history teacher. <laughs> just because I might be like, oh, that one's got like a scale in it, and I can come up with like 20 more like clues based around a scale, and it's only 35 yeah. bucks for the expand. Like, boom! Right. Like, I'll I'll blow 35 bucks to add like 20 more ways I can come up with clues for my kids. Well, that's kind of where we get super geeked up is like really getting folks like potentially um, Tinker, the the coding company. I think I've shared this before with all of you, but at one point or the other. But they are working on a, a Wi-Fi lock, you know, that could potentially be used in a game where the students have to use code to, to crack open the, the lock there. So really looking at these other elements. I forgot who shared it. Maybe it was Kern, maybe it was some other teacher shared that he's working on a concept of a parrot drone, you know, those programmable this, this drones that would, the students would have to program it to, you know, fly to a certain elevation. So, like, go forward six feet, rise up ten feet, and this is like in a coding terminal with Lockley, and a five forward three feet, and then take a picture, and then they'd be taking a picture of the top of like a bookcase that they can't get to, and then that would be the information, and then they have to have it return back to them, fly back, and then land, you know. And but really trying to, I the, the challenge that I think we'll have, and I'm really excited about it, trying to overcome is wanting to make sure that the core pieces of the kit, you know, work for ev almost everything and then you know then saying if you happen to use Minecraft or if you happen to use this here are some other types of games but really trying to fulfill that promise of you have this kit and we're focused on that um, for as long as we can see right now so and then I mean so that's 
what we're really excited. Um, Mark, I don't know if you wanted to share, but you had a chat with uh, Masterlock and um, some of these other lock companies, um, uh, which is, I think, a really cool idea about trying to maybe even, you know, get some branded locks and things that are a little bit more fun. But we'll, we'll see on, on that. Any final questions for Michael before I transition to a little of a discussion on uh, game facilitation and um, some questions there? Sweet. So the next part of the conversation, I wanted to focus on uh, facilitating a game. Uh, I'll share a resource in the, the, the blog post roundup on this Hangout um, but of how I introduce a game, but really wanting to hear from others. So there's two, two key pieces, I think, um, but I'm probably doing it wrong. The first key piece, I think, is really emphasizing the, the, the idea that it's, it's, it's teamwork, right, that they need to work together. Um, you know, it's definitely not a competition to figure out who in the team is the smartest at opening a lock. Um, really trying to think about, okay, you guys are successful, you know, in addition to potentially opening the box, but also if everybody, when you get to that point, is aware of how the different pieces were solved. Um, you know, so kind of like I was describing earlier when we're talking about Michael's point system, but, you know, like, if you guys arrive at the end and there's only two players that know how you, they were able to solve it, you know, I would deem that as a failure. Um, as, a, as, a, as a group dynamic. Um, you know, that's where I think having games that fork off, like Michael was describing, but also really just emphasizing that this is a team. Um, and one of the beauties and also challenges with a breakout is that you, it's very transparent who's participating and who's, and who's not. Um, whereas if you hand out a worksheet to a group of students, you don't know who's engaged. You might look around the room and you see the pencils moving, but you don't know what's going on. But if they're physically moving around, um, then it becomes much more much more transparent. And I've seen a couple examples where we've facilitated a game and 12 people have had an amazing experience and there's one person that felt like they were left out. Um, you know, so really trying to emphasize that. And ever since, um, ever since that one experience, I harp on it before the game starts and I haven't had that same issue. Um, and then the other piece that I wanted to talk about as far as facilitating a game, and then I'd love to hear from people that have facilitated one, especially Mark, who's done quite a few now, um, is the, the role of the hint, hint cards. Um, and the way that we introduce the hint cards is uh, hopefully all the games that you guys are designing um, will incorporate them, but basically a hint card allows the players of the game at any point uh, when they reach their frustration level to ask for a hint. And then you as the game facilitator determine what those breadcrumbs are that you want to leave them as far as the hint to get them to the next point, or at least through the next point in, in the game. Um, but what that does is it allows you to really step back from that process and let them fail as much as they're comfortable failing. And you know that they, whenever they need it, they will ask for your help, but then you're, you're removed from this weird experiment of trying to decide, do I help now? Do I wait? Do I help too early? And, and whatnot. And because I'm the worst when it comes to facilitating these things. Like, I want to help these poor learners, like, every single part of the way. Like, this game, that Time Warp, that we've been facilitating, there's there was some uh, hieroglyphics on the bottom of the table, and it would pain me that they would be te going 10 minutes without having looked underneath this table, and I'm like, look under the table, like, trying to, like, telecommunicate with these folks that are, like, not going to make any progress in the game, but really trying to just sit on your hands and say, hey, they have a hint card. Wait for them to use it. So, um, Mark, do you have any advice or tips when you facilitated a game? Uh, um, I'm not sure if you said it or not, but it was really the uh, the rehashing of all the clues before you give the hints. And for me, it's always uh, I use that time to kind of, you know, I'm trying to facilitate when I'm facilitating. I'm trying to get a read for everybody, but that's also a really good time to get a good read because as I'm telling a hint, like, oh, did you guys notice what Stephen found over here? Or, you know, as they're rehashing. I get to hear the leader of the group kind of always dictate, but then I can look around to see who has any of the different parts of the clue. So really kind of like take a survey of the crowd as they're rehashing, um, I found to be really beneficial as well. That's a good suggestion. And it is kind of funny to see how the, the leaders form organically or and then and sometimes lead them astray. <laughs> and that's kind of funny where they're like, they're like, no, no, I've already tried that before. And, like, the power of no, like, once somebody says no to the group and you're sitting there as a facilitator just cringing because you know, like, they're squashing the one correct idea that they haven't tried yet. Um, and um, also, like, what I really like about it is 
it's very authentic in that they keep trying to work the information until they get it right. Whereas if you handed them a math problem and they got it incorrect, they would go, you know, you get four out of five instead of five out of five. But in the, the lock, it doesn't come open until you've actually gotten it correct. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I do want to add one point too in, in making sure that people save the clues that they find. Because mm -hmm. I, I facilitated a group today to be completely uh, transparent. I wasn't exactly sure what I was going to do with this group. So last night, right before I went to bed, I thought, hey, I'll do a breakout game. Um, it was a group of admins, a couple of new ones, uh, an interim person, the superintendent of a district. And um, one of the clues I had, I, I taped a thumb drive to the bottom of the clock on the wall. And that was key to the next clue. But I saw one person, literally, they went up and they, they grabbed the clock and they moved it up a little bit. Their thumb was on the, the thumb drive. And, I, and that's just, it wasn't a pun, but it, it just kind of worked out that way. Um, they moved up the clock a little bit. They brought it back down. And I was like, oh, they, they have it. And they just kind of walked away. And then that was when they asked for a hint. But both of the people that looked at the clock, it's like, oh, we, we, I just thought that was a bracket for holding the clock versus saying, like, hey, is this a bracket for holding the clock? And if you had more than one person look at it, yeah. they would have found out that that was the next clue. So really, really sharing out those clues and making sure everybody hears. Um, when I went through uh, my first uh, true escape room, it was almost too much of an extreme where everybody was sharing so much and there wasn't enough time for that processing power. Yeah, it's definitely a balance. I think it's funny, though. I love it when people will, like, uh, I did one in Colorado facilitating one with some teachers, and I, there was a lockbox in the microwave, and this lady opened the microwave, saw the lockbox, and then closed it back up and then walked away. And I called her over, and I'm like, I'll just pretend her name is Sally. It's like, Sally, like, was there anything in the microwave? And she's like, yeah, there was a lockbox. I'm like, well, why didn't you tell your teammates about that? And she's like, well, I didn't want to ruin the surprise for them. And it's like, all right, well, the objective of that's where I'm like, I did a really poor job of introducing the game. Like, the objective of the game is to work together to try to get this open, not have everybody have these unique experiences finding things underneath tables. Um, so uh, that, that's really fun. And, Mark, I thought the clue that the thing that you did to your game today was uh, really interesting with uh, the tape and the key. Do you want to share that story? Oh, yeah. So, um, again, last-minute planning. I was thinking, well, what can I do to, like, make this game a little bit harder? So I used one of the, uh, the hasps that uh, comes with our kit. And normally I just had the directional lock on it, but I thought, you know what, I'm just going to throw another lock on there. And as opposed to hiding the key for the lock somewhere randomly throughout the room, I just decided to take the key to the bottom of the box. And when I got there, some of the people were already sitting around the table, and I asked everybody, can you guys all leave? I need to set up something. So when they came back in, the box was just sitting in the middle of the room. And I even put a, bar, or a QR code on top and said, the game will start as soon as you scan this bar, uh, QR code. But then for the next 58 and a half or 57 and a half minutes, the box never moved. And then finally somebody just looked at it like with a minute, uh, like two minutes left. And they're like, oh, is there something underneath there? And they lifted up the box, saw the key and opened it up and were able to break out with like a minute 40 left. But it was kind of interesting because I've seen situations where people like manhandle the boxes and some in this situation, nobody touched it for 50 plus minutes. So, uh, you know, sometimes the most obvious clues are the ones right in front of us. Um, so one of the things that just kind of to, to close us and then also open it up for more questions um, is, you know, just really working to, to add story and, add, and align these things to different content areas. So like what Michael's doing with Mesopotamia and taking all of his wizard HTML5 skills to build these cool online things, but at the end of the day, he's trying to design a game that can teach students about, you know, the history of Mesopotamia and the first humans and whatnot. Um, I'm just assuming that that's what we're going after. I used to teach Mesopotamia, so sorry if I'm misconstruing sorry. all of this stuff. Um, and, and then, you know, like this other teacher who's doing some mystery stuff, but I think I'm really excited about the math games that are coming down the pike, and because that, a math game will really allow, or I mean, on top of that, the games that require multiple disciplinaries when they are, you know, trying to, to go about doing these things. So, like, the, I think I shared this somewhere, but there's a, a game in development around Revolutionary War, but then in order to solve the puzzle, they have to calculate the number of boxes that the uh, revolutionaries put into the Boston Harbor or that of tea and try to calculate that number and divide it by something or whatever to deduce, like, come up with the next, the next clue and you know, and really thinking about, you know, they come across some biographies and they have to do research on all of them, but then they have to use the information to figure out which uh, member of the revolutionary uh, group was the most important or too relevant to this next clue in the game. Um, and then 
the the science thing that you just described, Michael, with the scale, that's where I get really excited is things like that where it's like you have to make this liquid turn from red to clear. And that, you know, and you have such amount of time to do that. And as soon as this liquid is now clear, you can you, you get the next clue in in the game. You know, and it's like, ah, somewhere in this box are these other chemicals, and then they have to look at the chemicals and they figure out which one they have to add and how much and what stuff like that. So um, great. Uh, any any uh, final questions and whatnot uh, to to the group? Uh, I'd love to hear quickly, uh, Lisa. You know, your interest in, in breakout and what you're thinking and um, and and everything. Yeah. So I'm coming in brand spanking new. I went to the GAF summit, you know, a few weeks ago, and my school. I teach in a in a K eight charter. I teach seventh grade history and English and um, math to seventh and eighth. Um, and it's it's totally in line with what we do at my school, which is all experiential, project-based. And so when I heard about it, oh, of course, I need to get my hands on this. So I ordered my box, and it hasn't arrived yet. But So I'm at the very, very beginning stages. So that's why I'm just sitting here listening. Awesome. Yeah, so like I, we shared at the beginning of the call, the, the hope is that everybody will get their boxes within two to three weeks of yeah. ordering. <laughs> Um, yeah, no, and I'm going to make sure that to put up some, no, this is also important that we put up some information online on kind of where we're at, just in case there's been an example of one kit that the post office just didn't deliver for some reason, or somewhere else, and we just assumed that he had got Nick had gotten it, and he didn't, and so he reached out to us, and so if we had been more transparent and said, hey, we've shipped all orders through 85, let us know. Um, but, you know, again, trying to figure out this process of it. I think just yesterday, don't tell, share, we just figured out how to add sales tax to all of these things. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah, we should probably do that. So we'll be paying uh, paying out of pocket on the, the first uh, 150. Um, but then, you know, now we've, we're, we're going to be um, do it, doing all things right there. So it's fun. You know, I, I've never done anything with physical goods before, but I'm very excited about the potential as far as, the learning outcomes, you know, and I think I shared on the Facebook group. If you're not a member, join that somehow. Reach out if you don't have the link. Yeah, yeah. Um, to, but the time lapse of what it looks like when people are playing one of these games. I saw that. Um, that was awesome. Like, it's so different and exactly what we should be trying to get in education. Um, so awesome. Any final questions or thoughts before we um, close? Uh Another question I have, and I get—I know I'm totally new. Um, it's unclear to me how I find out and get access to the games that exist. Yeah, so on the website you'll see a button at the top that's uh, games, and let me actually just pull it up to to, to model that because that's probably a good thing. Um, what we found is uh, if one person has that question, multiple people have that question. So let me just go ahead and walk through that process. Uh, so um, on the the website. Breakout.edu.com. Let's share the screen here. Should be loading. I know the uh, my computer's having a nice little heart attack because of the uh, work that it's doing for the Hangout. So learn more. Once you're in the website, you'll see at the top uh, some options. Uh, one of them is this thing called games. And if you click on that, uh, there I think there's six or seven games. We've got some new ones uh, in the queue for for next week. But all of these games, they currently don't have a password on them. Uh, we actually might re-add the password just so that your students can't look them up while they're playing. Um, but other than that, we're trying to norm around like a set password, like show your work or something very common that everybody knows as long as you you know are facilitating it. Um, and then you just click on it. So like Dr. Johnson right here is the, the game that I designed. Um, and it has the, uh, the story that you, you know, read to the players. Um, the setup instructions, um, but if you're a fan of video, there's a video that each of the game designers will create you know, describing exactly how to set it up in the places, the link to the digital resources, and then the materials that that game requires. Um, yeah, and so then the other, the other piece that's on there is the blog where we try to, um, you know, capture the, the different things that are going on and updates and whatnot. And then we, so here's the community call from last week if you want to see that the week before. Um, we launched a page called breakoutedu.com slash create. Uh, on that page, there's resources for um, creating your own games um, and a templates that we use and then some examples. And, you know, we'll be adding a, a video on the facilitation. I already created one um, of me facilitating in California. And there's another uh, video on the hint cards that's in the works, but really trying to capture all of uh, those pieces.
but thank you. For it. If any games are password protected, how do we find out what the password is? Well, the password will be show your work. Okay. Um, yeah, and that, and then there will be lots of, and it's already, it was in the it was in the last newsletter. Okay. Um, you know, warning people about it, but it'll be another couple of newsletters before I actually add it. But just trying to make it aware. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. And Michael, you had something to say? Uh, I mean, if you want to wrap this up, you can wrap it up. But <laughs> I still have like a million things I'd love to chat about. So let's do it. No, let's go all the way up to five thirty. That sounds good, and people can pop in or pop out as needed. Uh, so I mean, we talked about different ideas. So I know it's kind of silly because I'm not finished with my first one, but uh, always trying to generate ideas of different ways to use it. Um, I was curious about having two classes, again, being middle school, having two classes do it at the same time. Uh, so, you know, let's say I'm doing it in my history class and my counterpart's doing it in her science class and design a game where, like, half the clues exist in her class, half the clues exist in mine, and the two classes have to, like, communicate, you know, via Google Doc or whatever, you know, texting each other, whatever we would allow. Um, but the fact that they would then have to be practicing communication skills because, like, both classrooms would not be successful without sharing the information that's in both classrooms. Does that make sense? I, I love that kind of, like, this new kind of, like, a local version of the modern day mystery Skype, right? Where you can then, if teachers don't have that ability, can connect with other teachers, you know, somewhere else to run one of those games that require collaboration. Um, so it's not just, you know, a student sitting on the carpet chatting with somebody in a cool place, but they're actually collaborating on something. Um, Kern Kelly, uh, who's another one of the game designers uh, based in Maine, had this concept, and, you know, like, like all of us, we have more concepts than time. Um, but this idea that he had was, you know, they have one of those telepresence robots, right? And he wants to set it up to where his students would design games that anybody around the country can sign up for, but a part of the game would be you take over control of the telepresence robot at his school, and it's in this special room that they've designed for the game, and you have to drive it around to try to retrieve different information and stuff. So it's like, you know, one of the, game, one of the games could be the theme that we thought about was either, like, uh, trapped on Mars or trapped at the bottom of the ocean, and like sure. that's the only way to to get you got to save you guys, save yourselves, is to be able to go to the back to Earth or go back to the surface and send a message via some computer or something like that. I love the idea of multiple classes uh, d doing that stuff. Um, the other one I was curious about too is uh, anybody doing one that would be intentionally like dragged out more than the 45 minutes, like intentionally like we have this week, you know, like we launch it on Monday and make them either super hard or things they'd have to do via like their homework and things they're reading uh, to get all the clues to like really break this thing. I don't think there's any in development yet. I, I do know some folks have the idea of, uh, you know, using a MakerBot or something where they print out the different pieces after each stage of the game, so after 45 minutes. I could also see that happening, though, where it's like the storyline is complex enough. Let's say it's based on some sort of journey, and there's multiple spots along the journey, like you're going from like an end-of-the-year game for seventh grade history. How here would be like medieval West Africa would be like a level or a game, and then you'd go to medieval China or Japan, and then you go down to the Incan Empire, and it's kind of this, like, where in the world is Carmen San Diego type adventure. Sure. Um, but each game is, like, you know... But I think it'd be more set up as, like, a collection of smaller smaller games. But I also like the idea of, like, you know, kind of, like, the game would be played as if it was a trivia pursuit wheel, right? And you have to, like, put in all the different pieces or the Zelda diamond, and you've won when all of the pieces are, are in the diamond or something. And a teacher, let's say, over the course of a unit is completing these levels could have like a big poster on the wall and after each time they complete the level they put the diamond piece up or they crawl it in and they know that they've they've gotten this far in the game. Yeah, I love it. I just think there's so many things you can do with it. Um, it's going to be a fun year, I think, just as far as this community goes um, and getting seeing how people take it. And that's, you know, why we've done, we've worked really hard to say, hey, guys, like, there's really no reason to let's just use these pieces and design what you want and then share it. Um, and also, my question for you, Michael, um, you know, looking at what you're building, um, you know, some of that stuff is very professional. Are you thinking of, uh, you know, 
we, one of the things that a chat that came up in the, the the breakout Facebook community is like charging for games. You know, we definitely see this as like an, the app store equivalent. You know, and I know that, but we problem with this us as educators, we want to have everything be free, which is all of the games that we're creating. But you know, how, how do you think about that as you think about all the time that you're investing in designing one of those games? <laughs> I think not to put you on the spot. I'm curious. Like I want to encourage you. I'm like, man, like you just spent weeks developing this thing. You know, it's you should charge yeah. five dollars a piece for it. But I'm I'm really just curious. Uh, I think it's you said you said it perfectly that as educators, I mean, I love the idea of open source. Most everything I do, I blog. I just put it out there. You can have it, have it, have it. Yeah. Uh, and so I also want to have people play the game. And I know if it's five dollars, like. You know, that's going to like, you know, like maybe 2% of the breakout community will then ever get to try the game as opposed to if it's free and a cool one, maybe it's the most played, like, game, you know. So, I don't know. I think I would say probably free if I developed, like, a bunch of them and it was like people clearly liked them. Maybe I would sort of, you know, if you want to continue the story arc, you know, so you could play level one right. free. Hopefully you like it, and I have like up to five levels, and you could buy them all for like nine dollars or ten. Michael has his freemium model. I like that. One yeah. of the things that we're we're thinking, and I know you and I discussed it, but just to be transparent with the whole community, um, is you know really once the idea is baked out enough, and we're confident that you know this works, and we know, and there's games in the store and whatnot, but really trying to connect people like Michael, um, you know, or Kern or Chris Scott or whomever is designing these games with uh, textbook companies or content creators then say, hey, like he can design a killer game for your chapter on Mesopotamia. Um, you know, your textbook is boring as whatever. Let's just get um, a game in there for each of the different units and um, you know, and really connecting them with stuff. Kind of like taking the model that TED did with their TEDx or their, I mean, their TED TED Ed videos where they take um, uh, educator and pair them up with an awesome video animator. And so what we're hoping is maybe start to approach these textbook companies or curriculum writers and pairing them up with a game designer to, to get some really killer games that when teachers are forced to use, and I'm not going to name any companies here because I want them to like us when we go talk to them, um, but you know, let's say you are a writer of some chemistry textbook that bores kids to tears, and we come in and say, like, here's this game designer. Have them design a game for each of the chapters that kids can, can play. But the thing that you could really, I think, you could really tell to the textbook companies as well as to teachers, I find, like, the textbook, while I agree with all your previous points, possibly one of the greatest norming factors that could help you build an awesome game. Because it's like, you know that's a set data. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, like you said about the Boston Tea Party, how many, like, did they drop in? Like, that's one of those questionable history things that I'm sure if kids Google it, they're yep. going to get, like, ten different answers. And now yep. you're basing a whole math problem, whole game on this thing. I'm having the same problem with my Mesopotamia game. It's like, did, yeah, Hammurabi, all, all die? did, did, Hammurabi, did Hammurabi die at this date or did he die at that date? You know, like, ugh, and they're going to... So if it's, like, look in your textbook, and my textbook says he died in this state, period. Yep. Like, that can really help your game, I think. And that's where we think the real scalability would come in, knowing that, you know, regardless whether it's a, a, an old version of a textbook or a modern-day digital form of some sort of curriculum, you know, you, all, you have, like you said, normed uh, a lot of... Uh, you've controlled for a set of variables, uh, yeah. if you will. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, I'm excited about it. I think the textbook companies, that'd be a genius thing to do. Um, it would be a night... I mean, it would be an easy pairing... And I think for teachers, that would be an instant sell, right? Like, I mean, right, Lisa? Like, their middle school kids would dig that if they're like, well, well, at the end of every chapter, I can't wait. Or somewhere in this chapter, there's going to be. And teachers would love it because it's like the kit is a base set of material. It's not like I have to go get 20 other things to make this thing work. It's like, wow, this has been designed around these locks. And all I got to do is print out a couple of sheets of paper and hide them around in a room. Right. And boom. And yeah. the truth of the matter is that there's one curricular area in which games have been included in kind of published programs, whether that be they be digital tools or not. It's actually math. Mm -hmm. um, I think math, not I mean, not that they're to this level. 
but math is definitely an area where 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 they've they've understood the value of gameplay more than yeah. any other. And I, I know there's teachers around the world who've done Google searches for, you know, history games, and myself included, right? Or, you know, science games, and your return is, like, this silly little, like, flash shockwave game that you, every time you type in the correct word, it kills, like, an alien or something, which is cool, you yeah. know, like, once you've killed ten aliens, though, you need a little bit something, it's a little something right. different. Well, the first thing I have to say as a seventh grade history teacher, I always find stuff for sixth, because I used to teach sixth, and there's a lot for U.S. history. Mm -hmm. But seventh, there isn't much. And it's a lot of really cool history. What but do you teach in seventh? You're, you're a seventh. content area, Michael, which is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we start out in uh, the fall of the fall Roman of the Empire. Empire. All the way up through the age of the dawn, uh, uh, the, age, the dawn of the age of revolution. So uh, after uh, your uh, stuff, right, Michael? Uh, so my, yeah, I go Mesopotamia to yes. Middle Ages of Europe. And I, I cover Middle Ages too, because um, we do the fall, and then we go all the way up through mid 18th century. We're supposed to. You do the well, you do the Black Plague and yeah, uh, we do, things like that yeah, as well. We do the Renaissance. We do the Reformation. We do. No, I'm with I'm I'm with you, Lisa. Like as a non U.S. history teacher, I mean, there's yeah. like if somebody wants to make a mint, if anybody's listening to this, like yes, go do some awesome stuff from middle yes. school world history. Yeah, there's well, a ton, but there's a ton for middle school, eighth grade. It's just sixth and seventh. Yeah. Well, I, it's definitely not a, a, a great resource, but I, I spent a couple of years teaching seventh grade history in California, uh, Lisa. So if you go to historywithstanders.com, you probably stumbled across a couple things. Um, feel free to, to steal anything you see there, but again, that was a number of years ago. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, one other idea I had, and I'm curious for you guys that have started to look at this or whatever. Uh, so I thought as a cool summative, maybe would be have each of my classes design a game based on our content of our current unit. And we'd tell them this at the, at the onset. So like we're going to do this. And they would design a game as a class. We'd all have to come up with clues, right? And then how you'd sort of score it Game-wise, not grade-wise, would be like a round robin. Like class one would game would be played by class two. Class two's game would be played by class one. And the like, you're hoping that they. How do I want? How do I have this figured out? Like you want them. To, your level, your measure of success is like how many clues they get through. Like. So you don't want to make it insanely hard, and then like they're stuck mm -hmm. in clue one. Like then, then you actually lose as the designers because like mm -hmm. you just intentionally made it super hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like you would score as a designer more points by like how close it took them, like how long. Like so, it did take them 45 minutes to solve it. They solved it in the last minute. That's that might be deemed a really solid new game. Or they lost, but they were down. Minute. But they were down by they were they only had one clue left. Like that's an awesome game. Right. Yeah, there's nothing worse well, than them finishing your game in like ten minutes and you're like, Oh, time to go back to the drawing board. Right. Well and how cool would it would it be too after they've played some games for them to come up with whatever those sweet spots are? Yeah. So I thought I them. thought that could be kind of fun as you uh -huh. know, as like a summative that they would be thinking as they're like studying, they could be like, Oh, yeah. this this could be a really cool totally. clue. You know, like we learned about this person going here. Maybe we could use those letters, play around with it, you know, make a clue out of it. Yeah, so like, for example, in the learning about medieval West Africa, the the trade, the silent trade, bartering, you could have things where it's like connected to science where they have to look up the atomic number for salt and gold or whatever and have to, you know, match those numbers to, you know, whatever. I know that the, through the three of us are, you know, history geeks, but, you know, I'm sure equally awesome would be, you know, thinking about it as science stuff. I know that Kern developed this concept where they have to look up atomic numbers and different things like that, but also, like we mentioned earlier, weights and stuff, and then obviously math is the no-brainer where you're opening up numeric or alpha codes uh, for all of them. It's, you know, any sort of fun little, you know, zombie unicorn right. type story would would uh, be would make for a cool math game. We're at uh, we're at one hour, um, so I do want to cut us off. Um, I We could talk about this for four hours, um, but um, I hope to have calls, you know, 
at least every other week, you know, if not more frequently. So, um, you know, be make sure you're checking your uh, um, newsletters, and we'll put it on the Facebook and then on the, the blog. But you know, also feel free to you know come together without us, you know, and do do your own little hangouts and meetups and stuff to to kind of chat about this stuff. But um, I'm super geeked up, and I'm I'm so excited that people like you guys are you know getting excited about it as well. And I think it's time to you know really design something and do something that you know changes how we approach teaching and learning you know it's we're, it's too too long where we're just saying oh let's do something differently and it's it's the same stuff but they're still sitting in seats with rows so well thanks James for putting this together what was that URL James for uh, looking for stuff that you created yeah history with Sanders like with Sanders dot com okay. um, is uh, is my uh, my website that I use when I was teaching um, okay thank you yeah, so awesome folks, and we will we'll be talking to you soon. And ping me directly, anybody that's watching this or on the hangout, ping me directly if you want to chat. Always down to set up a time and, and chat about this stuff. So we'll talk to you guys soon. Cool. Thanks. Bye.